um, thank you so much for um, being here. Um, I want to say hello to Stephen Grumbine, Grumbine, I'm sorry, <laughs> and Caleb, Caleb Mopin. You're muted, Stephen. Um, I'm just going to introduce them. Um, hold on just a second. Um, <laughs> um, Caleb Mopin is a journalist and political analyst and the director of Center for Political Innovation. And Steve Grumbine is um, a founder of Real Progressives and Real Progress in Action um, and an MMT advocate. And we're going to talk about um, the economics of student debt um, cancellation. So um, thank you so much for being here. You got it. Thanks for having me on. Sure. Glad to be here. <laughs> um, uh, if you get the chance to share it um, <laughs> on any channel that you might have, please do so. And um, uh, let's start with just the basics. Um, I'm going to go to Stephen first. Um, what is the basics of what is MMT? Well, MMT is the way economics actually is. It's it's a description of the way a modern economy functions today. Um, it doesn't really tell you anything moral. It doesn't give you a prescription for what policies to pursue. It simply tells you that most of the things that the right and the left have been saying about how money works and where money comes from and so forth, they're completely wrong. And so almost everything that we do in our conversations, our exchanges, our thoughts about theory of, of you know, socialism and this, that, and the other, always end up butchering this with 150-year-old understanding of commodity money, which we are not involved with anymore. So MMT basically demystifies how federal finance works, how a country that has a sovereign free-floating fiat currency works. And, and what we can and cannot do with it by, you know, what, what is our vision of what a better world looks like? And once you understand that, see the right wing and, and the bad sound money left wing have been running us into the ground forever. We need a group of people that really understand how to use this, stop falling back on fake arguments like Milton Friedman's quantity theory of money and all this other nonsense, and really focus on how we can improve society today and how we can bring about a more democratic nation, more democratic in our workplace, in our schools, in our lives in general. And so those are political questions. MMT is the playbook on how to use the plumbing of the finance system and MMTers are the only ones out there that get it right right now, unfortunately. So we've got a lot of work to do. So um, uh, we live in a debt based economy. Um, Caleb, can you speak to what you think of the debt based economy or if you know anything about the history of um, our debt, our current debt based economy, um, what your opinion is like just your general opinion? Well, it's interesting because I generally come at things from, you know, a Marxist, socialist, left wing perspective. Um, but if that's too radical for you, if you don't want to explore Karl Marx and Frederick Engels and Lenin and others, uh, I would recommend uh, you read something called uh, the Bible, uh, because every major religion, Christianity, Judaism and Islam forbids the lending of money at interest. And there's a reason for that, because. If you lend money at interest, you pretty soon have a creditor class, a group of people who get wealthy by having money. They make money by having money. Nothing is being produced. And you can read this uh, throughout the history of, of uh, religious theology. Uh, people talk about how money is sterile. Uh, you know, And when money is created by means of having money, when money creates other money, no real value, no physical economy is being created. And, uh, you know, my, we're, the Center for Political Innovation, we actually just recently published this book, uh, Jesus is a Socialist. And I'll, I'll, I'll just read to you, uh, you know, what, what the Bible itself says. It says, if your brother becomes poor and cannot maintain himself with you, you shall support him as though he were a stranger and a sojourner, and he shall live with you. Take no interest from him or profit, but fear your God that your brother may live beside you. You shall not lend him your money at interest, nor give him food for profit. Uh, and then later uh, in the New Testament of the Bible, it says, if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? This is Luke chapter 6, 34 through 35. Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But you love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. 
and your reward will be great and you will be the sons of the most high for he is un is kind to the ungrateful and the evil um and the notion of, of lending money at interest and generating revenue through derivative ripoff schemes, uh, this is contrary to the economic principles, not just of socialism and Marxism, uh, but of Alexander Hamilton and uh, the founders of the country. Uh, they believed in having a national bank where credit was assigned strategically in the interest of the country overall, not in the interest of private bankers and how they could make profits. And probably the most disturbing thing about this student debt ripoff scheme that has, has just ensnared millions of people and is, is destroying the financial future of the country uh, is that it, it really gets to the essence of how we view education. When we provide someone with an education, when someone gets an education, that's not us giving them a handout, right? That's, that's an investment in the future of the country. You need engineers to have a strong country. You need scientists to have a strong country. You need doctors. You need technical technicians. You need educated people. And, uh, you know, during the uh, 2016 presidential election, Donald Trump, he, he made this statement that he was going to force Apple to start making their iPhones in the United States. And Apple came out and they said, well, even if, if that was the case, we couldn't, even if we wanted to, we couldn't make our iPhones in the United States because there aren't enough engineers here. There aren't enough scientists. There aren't enough people with technical degrees that could do it. We're not investing in the future of the country. Instead, we have this attitude, oh, you want to go to school? Well, that's that's something you got to take out a loan for. That's, you know, for your own personal aggrandizement. That's that's a personal endeavor. That's like, you know, going to the beach or that's that's like uh, that's like, you know, taking a vacation or something. No, we should want people to go and study. We should be encouraging them to do it because that's investing in the future of the country. Right. And, and that's the whole reality of it. Um, and it's, it's really a disaster. You look at the educational system in the United States, you know, you go to the doctor's office. Often you're going to have a doctor from India. You're going to have a doctor from Russia. You're going to have a doctor from another country. And uh, why is that? Well, you can talk about brain drain. Right. Whereas, you know, we tend to strip developing countries of their professionals. Right. All these countries around the world that are trying to raise themselves up out of poverty, they invest in their population. And then we lure those folks to the United States. Uh, and, and then on top of that, we don't invest in educating our own population. I'm not against immigration, um, but we have to talk about this situation. It started really during the Cold War. It was a strategy for hurting the communist countries during the Cold War is, you know, these communist countries provide free education, you know, Cuba has the best medical school in the world, according to Ban Ki-moon. So these countries invest in their populations, and then the United States lures those folks away, um, and then we don't invest in our own population, so the developing countries don't have the professionals they need, uh, and we don't educate our own population, and, and everyone loses. It's a lose-lose so, strategy. So we're actually gonna have a recruiter from Cuba School of Medicine come on at 7 p.m. <laughs> if anyone would like to um, watch that session. And um, there's also gonna be someone that went to school in Thailand for anyone that wants to avoid debt by going to school abroad. And we're also gonna be talking about like trade school and community college options. Um, so uh, Steve, um, continuing this conversation, um, what are some of the biases that people have um, about our current economic system and um, how can understanding MMT confront some of these biases well so first off i'd like to just echo everything caleb said minus a few things they're just technical things that i would quibble over but i'm not gonna i agree with literally everything he said just now i'm a socialist but i also understand how money works and that's i think the challenge for our movement as a whole, you saw how paralyzed we were in 2016 when Hillary laughed at Bernie and said, how are you going to pay for it, Bernie? Pie in the sky, right? And every leftist under the sun broke out Bernie's website. Here's how he said he's going to pay for it. He's going to do a Wall Street speculation tax. He's going to do a this. He's... But taxes are functionally deleted. They literally do not get respent. So all the ideas about taxes paying for things is a right-wing Milton Friedman quantity theory of money, hard money, Volcker bullshit that we have been stuck with for a generation now. It has been the neoliberal engine that has allowed mass privatization to occur because we have convinced ourselves that the government can't afford to do nice things. But the government 
regardless of any tales from the fire pit of the bar stool, the government is the creator of the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar is a unit of measure like an inch or a pound, okay? And we have an arrangement with the Federal Reserve, which people, I'm not going to get into it right now because it's a deeper conversation than most people are willing to give it. It's like, the only thing federal about the Federal Reserve is the name. It's like, whatever, okay. The idea here is that the Federal Reserve was created by Congress. Congress has purposely chosen to go like this, to let go of the reins because they are captured. They are bought and sold, and they are literally serving capital. They are serving the powers that be. They're not serving us any longer. So when you look at this, it's not a functional issue. It's a capture issue. It's a matter of where the power lies, and the power by law is with our Congress, by us. They are representatives of us, technically, right? But they don't serve us. Almost none of the uh, plans and things that we would want as leftists, people that have studied Engels and people who have studied Lenin, people who have gone back further and checked out the French Revolution and gone back further and looked at the medieval era, et cetera, we see the trajectory of how capital retrenches itself, how the powers that be retrench themselves, and how the powers that be keep us needing to serve them. We are no longer the workers in the fields like the old surf days and feudalism and stuff. We are now technically free as we go to a job that many of us think is soul sucking that doesn't pay for our education nothing we're stuck we are autonomous units stuck fending in a collective world individually and that is a direct result of our poor understanding of how money works in 1971 richard nixon finally removed us from the bretton woods accord 1934 we were removed from the gold standard itself so almost everything every textbook that you've read has been based on us being in a gold standard so much of the debt driven money that we talk about is a direct policy decision by our congress not because it's an act of god god didn't speak out and say you must charge interest no that is a direct decision we could stop selling treasury bonds yesterday because all treasury bonds are is a basic income for the rich. Yep. That's really all they are. But they don't functionally fund our government. They're a savings account at the Fed. So if the more you think about debt, what is debt? Well, the national debt, which is what scares a lot of people, is merely the sum total of every untaxed dollar in the economy today. Okay, why does this matter? Well, if the government is the one that's providing the federal student loans. And if you go to all the federal servicing centers, these federal loan servicing centers, they all get paid based on how many loans they service, the customer satisfaction, et cetera. But they're getting paid. That's a whole industry that cropped up based on our neoliberal government trying to make it so that we are stuck paying for these things that should be a natural resource, that should be our investment in our country. It's not a financial thing. We can never run out of dollars. Dollars are as easy to come by as anything for the government. For us, they got it made as hard as it can be for us to get a hold of dollars by depressing wages, by making our lives a living hell to make us accept the unacceptable, to lose hope, to lose faith, to lose everything that we have, all of our internal drive, our willingness to unite and fight. But the minute you understand that the government is literally choosing to make us be in a debt arrangement, once you realize that they are literally putting you out there to suffer at the hands of predator lending, predatory lending, et cetera, you realize how deep the rabbit hole goes from predatory inclusion in housing after redlining, even for blacks and browns throughout this country. There were poor women, poor black women who were literally predated upon as they released and opened up the housing, they would put them into HUD housing where these houses were not even worth, I mean, you put your foot right through the floor, but they're selling them these houses and they're already condemnable the minute they were selling them. Kianga Yamada Taylor wrote a great book. If you ever get a chance to read it, um, it's all about literally the predatory inclusion that they have done to take the most, uh, vulnerable in society and put them in these debt arrangements. And that's what the student loan industry has done as well. What they have done, our government, not the student loan, those people are there as a result of government making this happen. This isn't some happenstance. This is by on intent. This is just like the insurance industry for healthcare. They have purposely made this decision that this is a way to fuel capital. If you look around the world, you can see how the, uh, the uh, monetary fund, the IMF, 
and the World Trade Organization go out to all these other countries, these poor global South countries, and literally rape and pillage them with these deals to take on private debt, to, to release the economy from government control and allowing it to be wide open for these predators to come in and set up shop in their own territory. That is what the entire economy is based on because we as leftists have forsaken an understanding of how fiat currency works. And, and it's just like blockchain. I, I don't know if you ever listened to the blockchain socialist, but he was on Glenn Greenwald the other day, made a great pitch that even though, yes, blockchain and all this stuff is not going to help us get all these things done. It is absolutely a private thing. Even though there's bad actors leading the way, the left should not forsake it for fear of being like the right. We should use it to embrace, to organize around. Well, the same goes with fiat currency. When we understand how it really works, not the tales from the fire pit of the tales from the bar stool, but the real way it actually works. And there are experts out there. It's not hard to find them. So don't ask a non-expert like Richard Wolf or someone else that doesn't know MMT. What do they think about MMT? Because they don't know. It's like asking a man what it's like to ovulate. Don't ask them. They don't know. So the idea here is to make sure that you put your attention where the problem is. And where the problem is, is neoliberalism, the privatization of our education, the privatization of our communities, the privatization of our national parks and treasures. I mean, think about what's happened in Detroit, for example. Detroit has been stripped bare of all of its natural resources, of all its treasures, its museums, you name it, all in the name of privatization. These vulture capitalists come in, steal everything out, and then sell it off at a profit. So That's what's happening across the board. So I'm glad you're bringing up just how debt works in general, because I think one of the things that people assume when they're talking about college kids, especially people with a more conservative bent that haven't been to college, it's like, well, you have a responsibility, you signed a form, you honor your responsibilities. Um, but this inflation of prices basically. It's happening everywhere. It's not just student debt. It also happens with housing. It also happens when you get a fine, like a parking fine. Um, and the police department uses that to pump their budget. Um, this debt-based system is something that it happens in, in, you know, it happens with small business, um, with commercial rent, if you're, if you're trying to start a small business. Um, how do you think um, politically, we can unite. Um, this question is for Caleb. Um, how do you think that we can maybe try to unite um, people that um, think that this is a a kind of an upper that student debt relief is some kind of college kid kind of upper crust issue um, that doesn't really pertain to their lives. Well, it's interesting that you ask that because uh, it's this time of year. It's actually uh, it's we're getting getting toward the holiday season here in the United States, and you know I think about about Christmas and uh, the way we observe the Christmas holiday culturally in the United States, uh, and you can really see the influence uh, not so much of of Christianity but of Germanic paganism on and Odin in particular. Right, we have this man who comes around once a year. An old man with a white beard to, to breathe life back into the earth for the winter solstice. And he flies through the sky with a magical team of reindeer. And, and this is very much, this is the, the myth of Odin, right? This is ancient Germanic paganism. You can talk about the, the wreaths and the pine trees and all of that. And, <laughs> and, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, you talk about Odin was the god of grit and valor. Right. Uh, you know, the ancient Norsemen used to, you know, slice themselves with knives as they were dying in their beds so that Odin would think they had died in battle and that they could then be ad admitted into the halls of Valhalla because only those who died on the battlefield uh, were allowed to enter heaven. Um, and, and you know, you think about free market neoliberal economics uh, that, that Steve was just talking about and Milton Friedman. Ayn Rand, uh, Friedrich von Hayek, it very much plays into that Odinist mindset. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you know? You're on your own. If you want something done, do it yourself, right? And in a lot of ways, you know, that's very prevalent throughout U.S. history. You know, this is supposed to be the land of the American dream, where if you work hard, you can accomplish anything, mind over matter. Um, and the neoliberal economists have tapped into that sentiment and, and used it to push a bunch of flim flam a bunch of utter nonsense, right? I, I mean, basic mathematics. I think we can all agree on mathematics here. You know, if I have two apples and then I add two more apples, I have four apples. But then if I take two apples away, 
I am back to two apples. And two apples is less than four apples. Now, we all agree on that, right? Well, if you agree with that, you're not a neoliberal economist. Uh, you're not a libertarian uh, because they believe that somehow we can cut our way into economic growth. We can cut the jobs of government workers. We can cut the we can cut the you know the food subsidies to low income families. Uh, we can we can stop investing in our roads. We can stop investing in our power plants and our water treatment facilities. And we can just cut here, cut there, and somehow we're going to magically have more. Well, in basic mathematics, when you subtract, you generally have less than what you started out with. Um, uh, but they have tapped into this, this mindset. And when you ask that question, the reason I'm going here it may seem like a roundabout answer. But the reason I'm going here uh, is because, uh, you know, this, this Odinist mindset, mind over matter, we're going to work hard. This is how they put down people who talk about the issue, the very important issue we're talking about here today, which is student debt. Because the idea is, you know, we're all just a bunch of sloppy, lazy millennials and, and Zoomers who don't want to go out and get a job. We want everything handed to us. And, and you know, honestly, honestly, at the end of the day, uh, you know, if we were to start investing in our population, if we were to start, you know, doing what other countries around the world that have had great success, like China, you know, that has really turned itself around is now at this point, some people say China is the largest economy in the it world. Um, uh, it, it's not telling people to be lazy. It's not telling people to be sloppy. It's the opposite. It's tapping into that hard work sentiment, but giving it a collective nature, working together, people pulling together to achieve a common aim, working hard, self-sacrifice, but not at the expense of others not in an individualist way, but rather the country coming together and Correct. working together to achieve their aim together. You know, one of my favorite writers is Anna Louise Strong. Anna Louise Strong was an American journalist. She was in Seattle during the great general strike of 1919. And she went to the Soviet Union and she lived in the Soviet Union during the 1930s. And one thing that she wrote in her autobiography, I Change Worlds, is she said that the American mindset, uh, you know, the motor mindedness that people associate with America was very well alive in the Soviet Union in the 1930s when they built the world's largest hydroelectrical power plant, the Dnieper Dam, uh, when they electrified the country, when they wiped out illiteracy. She said, she said, communism is 20th century Americanism and the Soviet Union is the new America. That was her attitude because that go get them collectivist mindset was there as they were rapidly industrializing their country with socialist central planning. So so when conservatives make it out like we just want to be, you know, I jokingly say that, unfortunately, you will occasionally encounter a, a pessimistic mindset. Right. You know, some people, they look at, at society that we live in and they say, you know, it's really unfair how rich these big bankers are. It's really unfair that you can work hard your whole life and get nothing for it. So they, they kind of get this this defeated, angry mindset and they say, well, F this stuff. Give me free stuff. Uh, F this. Yeah, F this. Give me free stuff. Well. I, I would tell people that successful socialist movements don't have that mindset at all. They have the opposite mindset. They, they pull into people's desire to be part of a community. Human beings are collective creatures by nature. Since the time we, you know, we were hunter gatherers in the woods up for, through feudalism and modern capitalism, we work together. We are tribal, tribal creatures who possess intelligence. We have the ability to create technology to make the environment serve us. That's the distinction between human beings and animals. You know, other, other species, as Frederick Engels said, they only interact with their environment, but we have the ability to make nature serve us, right? Human beings are very, very spectacular. And if we could get beyond this irrational system of profits in command, uh, and if we could rationally organize our economy and start investing in the future, I think, you know, we, we could do amazing things. Fusion energy, I mean, that's the answer to fossil fuels. You want to talk about the climate crisis. The answer isn't windmills and solar panels. They're great. I'm not opposed to windmills and solar panels, but they're not going to solve the problem. But fusion energy, that's the solution. If you look at what China is doing now with their artificial sun, that's how we could get beyond yeah. the nightmare of fossil fuels. So um, I like when you're talking about, um, you know, investing. I mean, I think of education as a tool. It doesn't have to be a college education necessarily. It could be trade school or some kind of informal education. Not everyone has to go to college, um, but education is the tool. And the government thinks that removing spending on that tool is going to make the economy more efficient. You just remove the tool that people need to actually have jobs, have productive jobs and participate in the economy. So that is the last thing where you should cut spending. 
theoretically. Um, that's how I think about it. I feel like it's logical, but I want to go back. Um, I mean, it's great to go back to the time of um, St. Nicholas and <laughs> um, the gold standard, um, in, you know, the 1920s, but I want to go back just to the Obama era um, because I feel like this was very, very important in terms of people understanding how student loans work. Um, so basically, um, when the Obama administration bailed out the banks, right after 2008 and did not bail out the students. Remember the student um, debt activism movement was very closely connected to Occupy, to the foreclosure um, to, to the foreclosure protest, which people don't really realize. Um, so it was two things that were simultaneously going on and a lot of those activists cooperated with each other. Um, when that happened, um, Obama removed bankruptcy protections for student loans, and he also, um, most of what, what he did basically when he bailed out the banks is that a lot of the loans that were previously owed to private banks today, that changed drastically because today over 90% of student loans are owed directly to the federal government. Um, what I'd like to ask you, Steve, which I don't fully understand myself, is how does that work when, since we are paying money for our student loans, most of us, directly to the federal government, is that just like an additional tax that we live with for the yes. rest of our lives? Yes. I mean, so so this is where if I could bring all my friends on the left together and have a beer with them or smoke a joint with them or do something fun with them and just kick back and talk about how a fiat currency works, right? It's It's a simple pathway. Congress authorizes a bill. Those instructions are signed off by the president. It's sent to the Federal Reserve, who then keystrokes money into whatever accounts that the government wants to spend from. The government neither has dollars nor doesn't have dollars. It creates them every time it spends. And every time it taxes, it literally deletes them because it completes a circuit. That's how a fiat currency works. Okay. This is not me making it up. This is how it works. This is the playbook, this is the plumbing manual. So if you take that understanding and you realize that the government itself is backstopping these loans, okay, and you're paying it to the government, the government doesn't need cash in its coffers. The government creates it every time it spends it. The velocity of a government spent dollar is one. It's spent one time. It cycles through the economy, does whatever it does. But then when it comes back to the government as a tax, it's deleted. It purges reserves. They go to zero. It's done. It's done its job. It's over. That dollar is not a permanent thing. And it's not a matter of printing money, which God forbid, I wish everybody could stop saying that collectively, but it's not printing money. It's literally how every dollar, every single dollar we spend on the military, every single one is a new dollar. Every single dollar we tax is a dead dollar. The birth of the dollar is the spending. The death of the dollar is the taxation, period. It doesn't matter whether you like that. That's the way it is. So once you understand that and you realize that the government is taking away your ability to write these things off in bankruptcy, this is literally going back as a tax. Now, let me tell you, there are skimmers through this process. These, these loan servicing companies are making money hand over fist. Now, mind you, it's only a fraction of a percentage that they make, but they have such a huge volume of loan servicing. Every time they touch them, they get a certain amount of money, a little small fragment of money, but that money piles up. And that's how Nelnet and all those other groups out there are making their money to stay afloat. And they're making money hand over fist to the point where they're having to apply grants out there and give money away is almost a foundation because they're making too much money, if that makes sense. So ultimately, once you understand that dynamic, then you start asking yourself, well, then what is the purpose of charging not only young kids? Let, let, I want to I rewrite that script right off the bat. It's not just young kids that are in steep student debt. Back in the time period that you talked about when the government was busy backstopping the collapse of the economy as uh, you know, all the housing market imploded and all the, uh, the BS that went down uh, with Fannie and Freddie and Countrywide and all that stuff. Well, there was a lot of people that lost their jobs. And these old people, people like myself, went back to school. You know, I have two master's degrees. I started a Ph.D., and I literally have $122,000 in student debt that I'm staring at and $899 monthly payment 
for that student debt. So that money, why, why am I paying that money? I mean, this money should be a thing for my family to enhance its, its well-being, to enhance the society, to enhance the country, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But instead, it's used as a control mechanism. It's a control mechanism to force us to do certain things that maybe we would or would not want to do. Because what is the tax's purpose? The tax's purpose is to control behavior. It's to drive the need for the dollar. Every time we raise taxes, we create more of a need for U.S. currency. Now, if we tax at the high end, they don't feel it. They just get rid of it. But they, they tax us at the low end. Every dollar for us hurts. That's the difference between us eating that's a difference between us keeping our power and electric on. It's a difference between getting to and from a job, right? So they're trying to control the poor, the, the, the worker bees, because back in the day when you were a peasant, you lived in a, in a surf and a feudal farm situation that you were controlled by that Lord. The Lord gave you so much land to till. You did so much. Then you volunteered and did land. You didn't volunteer. You were part of your deal was you would then in turn do his uh, fields as well. But that was a means of control. And everybody was like, oh, this isn't so horrible. I guess I get food and I get shelter and blah, blah, blah. Well, now we don't even have the food and shelter. We ain't even nearly as good as feudal society in a sense because we are so precarious. We're all after each other's own thing. And we're literally desperate. We're running from an ax that every one of us is hiding from, trying to. And some of us are a little further ahead of the ax. You're like, I only have to be faster than the guy behind me. <laughs> the ax hits some, um, I'm good. But eventually the ax gets to more and more people. And that's what you're seeing with student debt right now. That student debt has crept deeper and deeper and deeper in because the families, the generational wealth that was there for a lot of people to afford a $5,000 bachelor's degree now have to instead come up with 60, 70, 80,000 for that same bachelor's degree. And let me just add this before you cut me off because I think this is super important. There's a gentleman named Davarian Baldwin and this man teaches at Trinity. He's a brilliant guy. I just interviewed him a few days ago. And he talks about the ivory tower of the university system. These universities come and they plant themselves down. Look at like Princeton, look at uh, uh, Yale, look at all these different big schools. They plant themselves down university of Arizona, you name it. And then they become the city. They literally are not only tax free nonprofits, but they also serve as the largest landholder in their communities. Then they wall off the community from the black and brown people in the poor sections. They sit there and bring private police in to police the community while simultaneously cracking down in black and brown communities outside the wall, et cetera. And all this is in the name of building another football stadium, building another amenity so that the rich kids have a reason to come to campus. And it's this environment that keeps jacking the price of education up through the roof. And simultaneously, we're not only paying for it, but they're not paying taxes in their local communities now. And so those local communities are drying up, save for the goodwill of these neoliberal institutions that are there bought and paid for by big corporations to train people to do the kinds of work they would want them to do if they came to work for them. So once again, training, education, and development for these corporations has been completely subsidized by you and me, not the government, you and me with our student debt. This is messed up. This is horrible. And that, my friend, is why this thing is going to hell in a handbasket, why we got to fight back. So I, I, I'm glad you brought up the the colleges and how they're expanding um, land-wise. Um, to what extent do you think, uh, maybe for, for Caleb, um, I'll have this question for Caleb. I grew up um, in uh, New York City and um, I, at the time I lived not that far from Columbia University and Columbia University essentially took over my neighborhood. Um, they were involved in many scandals um, where they were connected to uh, evictions, basically. They they encouraged evictions. Um, and Columbia University is one of the largest landowners in New York City. So um, could you talk a little bit more about how these universities are not just educational institutions, but predatory businesses that aren't just affecting college students, um, but are also affecting everyone that lives around the college, how they take over, how they get tax cuts while small businesses have to pay for more taxes. Um, and you know, what do you think about this, Caleb? 
Well, there's a lot I could say there. You know, it's it's particularly interesting. Um, Columbia University, and that there was an incident there in 1968, kind of a rebellion that combined, you know, community outrage uh, from the community of Harlem with outrage about U.S. foreign policy and how they kind of walked hand in hand. Uh, you can look at the incident that happened 1968 columbia university where the students you know took over buildings and it was quite an incident um but a little known fact is that columbia university is also a uh, very very important to american intelligence uh, Zbigniew brzezinski uh, who was one of the uh the main uh you know strategists of the late cold war policies of the United States uh, and working to bring down the Soviet Union. Uh, he's out of Columbia University. Barack Obama studied there uh, in, in the department uh, in the institution set up by Columbia University. I understand that there's a, a fight song at, at Columbia University. They say, who runs New York? Who runs New York? Who runs New York? The people say, we run New York. We run New York. C-O-L-U-M-B-I-A. Hey, well, apparently years ago, there used to be protests outside of Columbia University where people would say, who runs New York? Who runs New York? Who runs New York? Do people say they run New York? They run New York. C O L U M C I A. That's what people used to used to say when they were protesting Columbia University. Um, but one of the wild things is, you know, I mean, I, I went to a, a school in Ohio. I, I went to like kind of a small school in, in Ohio. Um, but my whole life, my whole family, everyone said to me, you're going to love college, Caleb. You're just going to love college. It's going to be so amazing. You're a bookish kind of guy. You read. You're always talking. You're going to love college. I hated college. I'll just tell you the truth. <laughs> I didn't like it at all. Um, but, um, but the reason that my relatives and my parents and my aunts and my uncles were all telling me I was going to love college is because the role of universities has drastically changed in the United States in the past 20 to 30 years. It used to be the universities were a place of dissident thought. Uh, it used to be, they were, you know, they were kind of the, the place that was, it was where you would go to be exposed to new ideas, to question things. It was, it was a place for the folks who thought a little bit deeper than average folks. Now it's not like that at all. If you look at the role the universities play, it's the opposite. Average Americans who haven't been to college are sick of these wars. They want the troops home from Afghanistan. They're happy the USA is pulled out. They, they don't want the USA meddling in the affairs of countries around the world. It's Americans who've been to college and taken international studies and think that they're educated, who've been informed about why it is we have to have troops in Afghanistan and why it is that we need to overthrow the government of Nicaragua and why it is that Russia and China are a threat. And instead of being a place for people to learn to think more broadly and question things, universities are increasingly becoming a place uh, that people are essentially taught the party line of the ruling elite so that they can be a trusted part of this professional managerial class. Uh, you know, and, and it's the opposite of the role that they historically played. And that's what universities are doing. And part of that is creating an infantilizing environment. You know, I, I'm a leftist and I'll tell you, I never want to hear anybody ever say, now, if you hear me clap once, if you hear me clap twice, if you hear me clap three times, I never want to hear that again. And, you know, I mean, I, I talked to, you know, older folks when I was in college, the college librarian was a good friend of mine. He was a guy who had who spoke Chinese and Vietnamese fluently and had traveled the world. And he said, you know, when I went to college, it was pretty basic. You know, here's your room in the dorm. Here are your books. Start studying. But this kind of infantilizing environment they create that also comes with kind of the, the political correctness and, and all of that. It's all about kind of creating an atmosphere where people are afraid to think for themselves. People learn to obey authority um, and they learn to be trusted enough to become, you know, architects and engineers of empire um, and preside over this decaying international financial system uh, that Wall Street and London sit at the center of. You know, um, they talk about how there are different models of, of global trade. You know, there's there's the, you know, the, the Eurasian model, which is, uh, you know, is historically that's Russia and China and the way that they've. They work. And then there's what you call the Atlanticist model. And the Atlanticist model is when you basically have an economy that is centered around control of the trade routes, where you have big cities, big cities that are at the center of, of finance that dominate the trade routes and enrich themselves by controlling global trade, maintaining a monopoly. That's how the Roman Empire operated. You know, they said all roads lead to Rome. What that meant was if you were in one part of the empire and you wanted to build a road to another part of the empire, you couldn't do it because Rome had to be the middleman in global trade. That's how Wall Street and London operate. Um, and they basically, they don't mind seeing the world get poorer and poorer and poorer just so long as they can be the giant middleman. Um, but the Eurasian model, uh, where development is essential and you have kind of uh, the idea of bringing 
parts of the globe together, right? You know, you know, China, they're really into one China. Uh, the reason for that is because historically the way China has been impoverished is when they, they divide it, you know, when Tibet is separate, when the Uyghur regions are separate, when Hong Kong is separate, when Taiwan is separate, it's poor. But when they're together, pulling together, they can start to economically develop. That's why you can see one of the most you know, famous movies for, from Russia that came out during World War II is called Ivan the Terrible. And it's about, you know, Tsar Ivan, uh, who brought, uh, brought, you know, Russia together. And by doing that was able to raise people up. And that the, the Eurasian model for international relations, what China is doing with their one belt, one road initiative, what Russia is doing with the Eurasian Economic Union, what, what's going on with the Bolivarian alternative of Latin America uh, centered around Venezuela and Bolivia. It's a different model in global trade. And that uh, the, the educational system in the United States, you know, yes, we want it to be free. College should be free. It should absolutely be free. This student debt ripoff scheme has got to end. But a lot more things have got to change. We've got to be training people to think for themselves and think critically. Uh, we've got to be orienting people toward, you know, toward things like science and technology. Um, there's a lot of things that need to change in the United States. The university system is kind of a concentration of a lot of the problems we're having as a society. So um, I want to go back to uh, Steve Grumbine's uh, point about commodities, about um, how are, are people think that um, our economy is based on this commodity system that you mentioned. Um, I had, a, a, so, and I'm going to bring it back to an experience of mine. I had a, a loan, um, one of my few loans that was private, um, and um, it was sold to another creditor. And I had paid it off, and then they start creditors started chasing me again, saying that I had not. Basically, I had paid off around ten thousand dollars, and then creditors started chasing me, saying that I hadn't paid anything. And what I realized was that it was basically bought and sold um, like a stock, and that they had lost the information. Um, so um, I checked with other student debtors um, and one of them told me to request the original promissory note. And um, uh, do you have any information or like, could you talk a little bit about how student loans are bought and sold on the market um, and how, um, uh, we're, we're gonna talk a little bit more about this with the lawyer about um, requesting your original promissory note. Um, but can you talk a little bit more about how the predatory system basically relies on basically, um, you know, like in big investment companies, banks, being able to buy and sell debt cheaply and how MMT is different, how, you know, how um, basically, um, it, it, you know, it, it, that, that'll help you understand a little bit more about um, why these prices are so high. Um, let, let, me give you two, let me give you two things here real quick. I want to jump back to something Caleb said that it would be bad of me not to, to answer to. And that is he nailed it 100% that they are literally brainwashing you to serve the oligarchs plan, whatever that is. That's what the university system is doing now. It's no longer teaching how to think. It's no longer teaching free thought and go with it. They're literally teaching you to be a carrier of the oligarch message. That's number one. But there's a second part to that, and that's the military. So we're sending kids off to school on one hand, teaching them how to be good capitalists, how to be good taker carers of the oligarchs uh, world, if you will. On the flip side, we've got the kids going off to the military. So they're knocking it out with two two stones. One, they're teaching the people that are blue, white collar how to be good white collar, uh, you know, protectors of capital. And on the other side, they're teaching you how to never question these colors don't run this flag, man, do it for the flag. And they're teaching you how to be a jackbooted thug over here. You come back to society out of being in the military and what do you do with that knowledge? Now, all of a sudden, you've got a straight up fascist mindset. You have literally been brainwashed. And for those that can break free from that, it's a huge kudos. But that's a hard thing because the indoctrination is intentional. It's not just for the killing machine. It's to protect it at home. So if you think about how many of those ex-military people that have literally walked in, you know, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed 
come out a killing machine, but come out with that drive. Don't you dare say that about the flag. This country, this country, our country, they are prepared. Two sides of the same coin to protect capital. This is a huge, huge, huge propaganda mission that has been highly successful. That said, back to your question about uh, selling uh, debt and so forth. That debt, what happens is this. If you look at normal credit relations, your object is to see, are you credit worthy? Is this a, something that we feel is beneficial to society to invest this loan into, to provide that loan? Because this loan impacts society. It's not just your loan. It's what are you going to do with it? And so there used to be a time where a smaller amount of loans were given, smaller amount of access to credit was given based on different things. Today now, the idea here is just to give everybody as much credit as possible, knowing full well that a certain percentage will absolutely default on that. But by bundling them together, they create those CDOs that they did with the mortgage industry. They do the same thing with the student loan industry. And let's be fair. They, you know, Bear Stearns thought the most secure thing in the world was housing debt, housing, uh, you know, rent, uh, the, the mortgages. So that was a safe bet. And the same thing they feel with student debt, because after all, you can't discharge it. Obama and Biden made sure you couldn't discharge it. So now what? So this is what it's all about. It really comes down to broadening access to huge amounts of credit because our entire society has been financialized. The idea of the public purpose has been eliminated. Almost every leftist is busy trying to make the wealthy. We got to get money from the billionaires to afford this. Oh my God, we've got to tax them higher to afford this. However, will we afford Medicare for all? We've got to make them pay their fair share. Well, the fact is that's after the fact. That's always after the fact. We don't need their money. We can render them irrelevant is the point. But they do this stuff because why? If you're an invest, if you're investing in student debt as like something, you're you're shorting it, you're overing it, whatever. If you're investing in that space, the only way to, to prevent a total collapse by people that do default is to bundle it with good debt and bad debt and create this like synthetic investment thing. It, it, it's not even real. It's like a bundle that they know is got a lot of failures in it, a lot of dogs in it. And that's what they did with the mortgage industry as well. And they have these fake like credit uh, rating agencies that go out there and basically do the bidding of capital. And they give this an A-plus rating, A-plus investment there, right? But the fact is, is that all of this stuff is there simply to expand capital markets, simply to expand the fire sector. And literally, we've gotten to the point where we don't produce shit. Now, that's another story for another day because it's a very involved conversation that should not just be exports good, imports bad, blah, blah. And that should not be the beginning and the ending of our understanding of global trade. But unfortunately, right now, a lot of people only go that far. And, and that's just a very, very shallow, not very uh, sophisticated uh, assessment. So we got, it requires more thought behind that. But with that in mind, if you look at why the student debt has gone up to so much, it's, it's not so much about them selling your loan. It's really more a matter of those agencies, those, those, those institutions literally trying to find a way to lure more and more rich kids to their campus, to have more and more swagger. And the only way to do that is amenities, 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 and the cost of all those amenities, 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 and all the ever-growing uh, footprint of each of these universities requires more and more and more financial capital to do. And, and that's really what you're seeing right now is a, a massive uh, shift away from the public purpose purely to neoliberal privatization schemes. And this is what spurs so much of the crypto market and so forth is nothing but neoliberal privatization schemes. And I got mine F you. And, and that right there is 100% got to become the battle of our lives, not just for student debt, which is a huge deal because it's 1.7 plus trillion in student debt that is on the backs of many old people that will die with this debt. 
young people that will never get started in life because of this debt and people in the middle of the road who will kill themselves because of this debt. We have got a suicide problem in this country based on debt as well. So much is costing us because of this neoliberal privatization scheme that if we don't stop it dead in its tracks, we will be dead because we've got a climate crisis going on right now too, ironically. So we've got all this stuff facing us. We can't get myopic in any one area. But the ability to relieve $1.7 trillion worth of drag on the economy that prevents each of us from getting our teeth filled, from getting you know meaningful uh, surgeries that we put off because we can't afford it, to get our roof fixed, to have a roof. I mean, you name it. All of that is being stifled by this drag of student debt and 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 we've got to put an end to it we have to put an end to it um caleb do you have a response to that or should i ask another question well um you know i agree with pretty much for the most part everything Steve said um so if you want to ask me another question you can just go ahead that'd be great um i'll probably have to get off of here in a little bit you know but i can keep going for the next five or five minutes or so so yeah go ahead okay um so uh I don't know if this is relevant, but you seem to be able to connect the dots in very um, unexpected ways, Caleb. So I I'm going to ask um, to go back to NAFTA and um, let's talk a little bit how our dying manufacturing industry, because uh, there aren't as many jobs available with only a high school degree, for those people that can't go into the trades, a lot of people say, oh, you should have gone to trade school. But there's problems with that, too. You know, for example, there's less women. Um, not everyone can go to trade school. Not everyone is like finds it a great environment for them, whatever. Um, uh, there's less good jobs today um, that are available with just a high school degree. And this causes more people to want to go to college. Um, it's, you know, it's logical. Um, what do you think about, um, uh, you know, also since you talk a lot about China, et cetera, um, how are dying manufacturing industry, and obviously we still manufacture some things, um, is related to this student debt crisis and what we can do, like, you know, maybe in other parts of the economy to turn that around. Um, and why it is that socially it's uh, become so difficult to find a job, not in every area, without just like piles and piles of degrees. Um, and, you know, um, you know how, how they're kind of forcing this behavior um, socially. Well, it, it's interesting because, you know, when you talk about NAFTA, you can talk about the fact that the people of Mexico have been growing their own food for thousands of years, long before Christopher Columbus ever showed up. Uh, but now uh, they're largely importing their food from American agribusiness because the way NAFTA worked was that it opened up their markets. Uh, it, it got rid of subsidies for domestic uh, you know, Mexican farmers. As a result, American agribusiness went in there and put the Mexican farmers out of business. And now they import their food from the United States, from American agribusiness. A similar thing happened to Haiti. You know, Haiti, they've been farming there since you know, the time of the, the slave revolution. Uh, but yet NAFTA went in and, and put them out of business. And, you know, yes, production does take place in a more global way. You know, if you talk about a single single laptop computer can be made in like 50 different countries. Right. And so that is that is global capitalism. But I will say that, you know, while that is a factor, while globalization is a factor in getting rid of labor, it's not the primary factor. The main thing getting rid of jobs is technology. The main jobs killer is technology. And this gets back to the the basic problem of capitalism, which is the problem of overproduction. The capitalist is constantly driving to produce as many goods as he possibly can and maximize his profits in doing so. You know, pay as little labor as he possibly can to do it, you know, produce them as cheaply as he possibly can, churn out the most goods as he can, maximize his profits. But the worker is also the consumer. So if you reduce the role of the, the person in production, and fewer and fewer people are hired, uh, workers are replaced with machines, eventually people cannot buy the products that are being produced. Um, and the computer revolution has taken that problem of overproduction, the problem that the worker cannot ever buy back what he produces, it has taken it to a far higher level. Uh, if you look at, you know, World War I came after some great technological leaps in how production was carried out. Uh, World War II came after the Great Depression, 
which was largely a result of Henry Ford and his assembly line innovations that made it much easier to produce things like radios and cars and such, and made technology much more efficient, made production more efficient, and as a result, eliminated people from the assembly line. And as a result, people couldn't buy back the products, and we had a prolonged capitalist crisis. We're now living in the aftermath of the computer revolution. And a college degree is probably not going to help you that much in dealing with this problem because it's not only, uh, you know, work in the assembly lines that the robots can do. The robots can play chess better than human beings. The robots can trade stocks better than human beings. And that increasingly the role of the of the worker in production is being decreased. And this is what is behind the global refugee crisis. Uh, this is what is behind uh, the dropping living standards and the, the rise of the low wage, short term service sector job economy for millennials and Zoomers. That's what this is all about, is that there is not a role for us at the assembly line. They have produced and they've gotten technology to be so efficient uh, that they don't have a place for us in the global assembly line. And this is the problem of capitalism. And the only way to overcome it is to have an economy that doesn't function according to profit. Have a rationally planned and organized economy so that, you know, so that growth can, can you know, continue. Uh, you know, in a rational economy, in a rational economy, self-driving cars would be a great thing because everyone who, who has a, a job driving a truck or a taxi driver or whatever can now do something else. There's less work to be done. But under capitalism, self-driving cars would create and is going to most likely create a huge economic problem of millions of people without jobs. That's not rational. That's not rational. That's the rule of profits. That's the capitalist system. Um, now, um, as as far as as what can be done about it, right? Uh, if this could be overturned, um, if, if we could get beyond profits and command, we could solve this. Now, I have in the past, this is the Center for Political Innovation, you can visit our website, cpiusa.org. Uh, we have a four point plan to rescue the economy. Step number one would be a mobilization to rebuild the country's infrastructure infrastructure, you know, you know, rebuild the bridges, rebuild the highways, high speed railway, Internet access for the whole country, et cetera, a, a mass mobilization, something like the Works Progress Administration of Roosevelt. Uh, step number two would be public control of our natural resources. America's oil, America's natural gas, America's coal, America's timber, all of our natural resources, the profits from them should belong to every American. Uh, they shouldn't belong to private corporations that just happen to get wealthier as, as places where they're they're coming from places like Alaska and Kentucky and Pennsylvania are getting poorer and poorer and poorer while the profits from their natural resources continue to go up. Step three would be public control of banking. Put the lending of money in the hands of the community. So instead of you know private banks trying to make a profit, credit can be strategically assigned in the long-term interest of the country, strategically building up the economy. And step four would be an economic bill of rights, the right to housing, the right to jobs, and most certainly the right to an education. A four-point plan. If you were to enact those four steps, the U.S. economy would rebound amazingly. We would have a huge amount of economic growth. Things would get much better very quickly. And there are many countries around the world that have similar economic programs and have built themselves up uh, with, with such success. Um, so, you know, I, rather than trying to get people to agree with an ideology, rather than trying to get people to agree on, on cultural issues, if we can go to people with a four-point plan, are you for these four things? Are you against them? That's a way we can push forward the conversation. And that's what the Center for Political Innovation is trying to do. I'm very interested to learn more about what Steve is talking about with modern mon monetary theory. I'm open to it. We need to have more conversations about, about these kind of things. And Let's I, do I really it. I really appreciate uh, being invited on here. Student debt is a curse hanging over this economy. But I believe if the people of this country come together and we mobilize and we don't just march behind the Democrats, but we really make clear demands, I think we can defeat the student debt crisis. I think we can march ahead. So thank you very much for having me on.